TLO, what's poppin'? We are on kick, K I C K dot com. We are not live. Particularly with like, comment, subscribe. Turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Uh, what's this behind me? This is the channel. You know what I'm saying? We go live and you happen to miss it. This is where the highlights and things of that nature will be. <clears throat> Don't forget, we do got the merch. You know what I'm saying? And we got the dis not the Discord, the Patreon as well. Appreciate the Patreon fam, man. This is a list of everything that's on there. You can just check it out on your time. Uh, the link to all of this is down in the description. Under link tree, just click it. It'll all pop up. This is Britain's most dangerous gangs revealed. How the lore of drugs and guns destroy our teenagers. This is from Talk TV. Uh, I don't even, I don't think I've ever even heard of them. Salute though. Let me, let me, let's, let's check it out. We had a video we got from the jail, an Erring Brother gang member. He was that murdering and mashes the sky on him. Are we straight into it? Ella's provide oh, okay. on the show some of the UK's most prolific crimes as this week. Hello and welcome to Crime Suspects, where each week we unravel some of the UK's most prolific crimes as well as providing in-depth analysis on the criminality that plagues our nation. On the show today, <coughs> who are the top dogs now? We dissect the very real threat from some of the most fearsome gangs in the UK today, shedding light on serious and organised crime as it continues to grow. Later, is it safe on your street? I'll be taking you, virtually, to the UK's capital. Oh yeah, we know virtually, my boy. We know you ain't stepping in now. Not on the ground, my boy. Virtually is the safest bet. London, for this week's Postcode Watch. And finally, it's your chance to book a crook as we show you this week's Watch. Chris no. Preddy, OBE. Joining me for all of this today are Chris Preddy, OBE, from the charity Hashtag Unapologetic, Apologetic. retired Met Detective Superintendent Shabnan Chowdhury, and former ecstasy trafficker turned YouTuber Sean Atwood. That is Sean, Thank I knew you it was. All very much for being here. Now, you have the right to remain what. It's an interesting panel they got police, criminal, and then youth organization person. This is crime suspect. So, serious organized crime costs the UK economy an estimated £37 billion per year. And within this startling figure, there's a whole host of criminal activities, such as drug trafficking, human trafficking, cybercrime, and money laundering. I want to say, man, almost off... You know, it costs $37 billion, but I'm almost positive. Like, when they seize money... Don't they put that back into it? Or no, they don't do that there. They don't use the money to... I don't know. What do they do with the money that they seize? Like in the assets and things of that nature. From these criminal... Increasingly, Britain's street gangs in certain inner city areas, such as London and Manchester, are becoming more of a cultural transmission of America's Crips and Bloods. According to the Director General of the National Crime Agency, Graham Bigger, there's around 59,000 people involved in serious organised crime within the UK, with about £12 billion generated by criminal activities oh, okay. each year and around 100 billion of dirty cash from around the world laundered through the UK. But behind these alarming numbers lie the stories of countless lives affected by the ruthless actions of these well, notorious gangs. My bad. Shabnam, you set up a gangs unit when you were in the police. 
based on your considerable experience, who are the gangs that are plaguing the streets and that we should be afraid of? Well, you've got um, Hackney, for example, which has the highest number of gangs across Hackney. London with 33 gangs. Uh, and then you've got Newham with something like 13. But you've got the Holly Street Boys, you've got the Balance Boys, you've got Burger Bar Boys from across the UK. You've got they're in Birmingham as well, they're, aren't they? They're in Birmingham. Yeah. Uh, so you've got a whole host of names, which some of these names actually come from, as you talked about earlier on, from America, from the Bloods and the... No, they don't. I ain't never heard none of them called... No, they don't. So the name, the gangs that she just named, she's trying to say that those names come from America? Crips. And that is because they like the kudos of being associated with American gangs, with, you know, suggesting that they come from, uh, from the hood in Brooklyn, places like that. So, yeah, quite um, a wide variety of young kids that are involved in criminal activity that are actually linked to some of the top, top, organised criminal gangs across the UK. These are the ones that earn something like 200 million, um, or are worth as much as 200 million. You can talk about the Adams family, who were notorious in the 80s and the 90s and were involved in extortion, in robberies, in, um, uh, in violence. Uh, they're now really, really established. And people will say, well, that was like 20, 30 years ago. But actually, those are the gangs that are established that still run the streets of London. She's not lying about that one. But that's, you know, that ain't hard to figure out. So, notorious gangs like the Helbanians. We all know that there's a top, 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 top upper echelons. For example, that so many people have heard of and who go online to show off their weaponry and their wealth and what have you. Would they have contacts or would they have influence over these kids that are carrying out the criminality on the streets? They have huge influence over them, Peter. What they do is they groom them. And then what they do is they initiate them into gangs. They will get them into buying trainers for them. They'll buy them bikes. I don't really like that name, groom, like that word. They need to reword that. Like, it, it suggests a lot of other things that could be going on, but it... They'll buy them all sorts of stuff. They'll get them to deliver drugs, guns and weapons. And then what they do is they get to a stage where they tell those kids, you've lost me money, you lost my drugs, or you've done something wrong, and now we own you. And it's really difficult for those young kids, many of them who actually want to exit those gangs, who cannot do that because of the fear of retribution by those uh, organised gangs. You mentioned America, which brings me quite brilliantly on to you, Sean. You didn't come up through the streets of gangs in the UK. Because I have no idea about Sean's story, so this should be listening. I mean, this should be, like, uh, educational. You came into criminality and drug dealing through a very different route. What was that? So I was a stockbroker gone wild, had more money than common sense, started to import ecstasy from Holland to Arizona. May 16th, 2002, SWAT team smashes my door down and I end up in Sheriff Joe wow. Arpaio's jail, America's toughest sheriff, where I'm living for almost six years then in the Arizona system with Bloods, Crips. Yeah, definitely. Arizona has one of the craziest prisons. I didn't know he was from there, but Arizona got it. <laughs> well, I went to Arizona last year. My boy's brother, his name is, his nickname is Blood. We used to call him Blood. And I didn't know who it was until I seen him. But I, he used to come to this park that I live by, and he used to hoop. And he got, this is, I can say it now, he got into a shootout with the Kings. So the park that I was at had a lot of GDs. Um, and Bloods, I guess the Bloods, they were cool. Or him, specifically. He was cool. Um... Because he was hooping, he could hoop like he could he could play ball real good. So he would come over there, um, and he was you know, it is what it is. You know, you at the park, you gotta rep, you gotta hold it down. So he they had came or I don't know what happened, but I was younger, and he grabbed me. And he was like, get under the car. I was like, I know what that means. So. But anyway, that's not the point of the story. But I seen him, and I was like, oh, blood, what's good with you, bro? And then uh, I was like, dang, 
we was in Arizona. He got out. I had a, I got, you know, I had bought him some whatever he needed, you know, when he first got out. Uh, it was just a crazy. It was crazy, but it's crazy that he bring up Arizona. I can, I can, I can front that he's not lying. For Arizona, got it because Arizona is full of bloods and crews. Heavy on the blood. Neo-Nazi gang members, Mau Mau gang members. When I arrived in America, yeah, the too. initiation ritual for the gang members was: if you see a car at night, my aunt warned me. If you see a car at night with its lights off, yes, do not flash your lights at it. If you see a car at night with its lights off, this is this is West Coast gangs do this a lot. Arizona, uh, Cali. If you see a car with the lights on and you flash them, the first car to flash them, they're gonna get on you, and that's the initiation. Do not flash them to turn their lights on, because they will shoot you dead. This yeah. is the gang initiation yeah. ritual. And to add on to what Shabna said, out of all of the podcast guests we've interviewed, one told us a story whereby in this country, a young person owed the Albanian mafia money. He'd gone behind on his payments. They showed up at his house and took his eyeball out. No living being should ever eat processed. Listen, the Albanians is wild, so I believe it. Oh, my bad. Violence, violence, violence. This is, you know, it's becoming a theme. Chris, I'm sure that you have experiences or <coughs> you've heard tales of violence. What is it about violence and gangs? Is it a currency? Is it some kind of kudos? Why do we hear about it all the time? Well, obviously, like what goes down to anything, everybody knows. Side note, before we move on, I was, sorry. before we move on about that initiation out there, it is what it is, but at the same time, I, I got little, very little respect for it. Because these are civilians just trying to do a good thing, you know what I'm saying? Oh, turn your lights on. That's a civilian that did that to you. At the end of the day, you, your initiation is harming civilians. I don't stand by that. I don't stand by any violence, YouTube. If you're watching, like we always say, you know, the public, everybody knows when you have a certain sense of power. So if you're watching, like we always say, you know, the public Escobar, you know, the Scarface. And I keep saying to some of these kids, they watch these movies, thinking that they're going to get that end status at the end. And once again, like you said, it's that manipulation in the sense of, I'm going to score a point it's against reality. you. So I'm going to show reality. my violence in the sense of, it's always got to be tapped up to a sense of who's more worse or who's got, who's got the most kind of like points on their scoreboard. And like I say, with a lot of these young people, if you're stabbed and you've now been filmed and someone's filmed you stabbing, then that gets to a stage now, what are you going to do to get back on that other gang? You're going to have to film and then you're going to have to do 10 times worse. So once again, it's all about now matching up each other, which the violence has now got out of control. And I feel we need to come to a basic system and understanding that you've got to remember, these are 13, 14, 15, 16 year old boys that are taking lives. And how do they get ensnared into this gang culture from the very beginning? Well, like with most people in a sense of, we come from poor backgrounds, you know, as their lack of opportunities. You know, you've got to think about the, the many of the systems of where I grew up and where we are now. There is no youth clubs. There's no opportunities for our young people to be able to do anything. You go around to any of these single areas, there's no ball games, there's no activities. So once again- It's these... even so bad in America. Like if you go to some of the parks, they take the rims off the basketball court. Like, you're really giving, like, nobody, so you're literally really giving kids nothing to do. This is a park. You took the rims off the basketball court. So in America, they're associating, why they do that is because they, they, they associate, like, the gangs, they come in, they congregate around the court. Oh, my God. Like, be, be, come on. Young people are just out. You want them around the court or you want them in the streets, doing street stuff? They're on the streets doing nothing anyway. And I always say boredom breeds certain other things. You know, you start Facts. off nicking a sweet from the shop. You know, you start off in the sense of seeing a gang member standing on the street corner. If he was doing activities, you would never see him in the first place. So right. now all of a sudden he sees you, he starts to groom you. And it's very simple as, do you know what, here's a bike. What do you mean? This is not my bike. I don't want this bike. No, 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 this is your bike. You can have this bike. Oh, my mum won't let me have it. No, 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 it's for, it's for you. You can keep it out of my house. But anytime you want it, this is your bike. And before you know it, you're riding down the street and he comes up to you one day and he says to you, give him, see that bag, take it down the road and give it to that person. And I say this to my kids every single time. What's in the bag? Drugs, sir, money, weapons. I don't know. 
But once again, do you think that he cared when I was dropping it? That happened to me before. It used to be this dude. He used to come outside my house, right? Not for me, but he used to do drop-offs and pickups outside the house. Um, so somebody would come, they would drop, throw it under the car. But he's a full-grown adult. I'm a child. You know, I'm outside playing, whatever. And he used to tell me, hey, yo, come go, yo, come grab this for me. And then he used to, I used to grab it. And then he'd like give me like $20 and ones. I'm thinking, I'm rich. You know, I'm a child. I'm getting young. I had to be like 10. It starts young out there. Down there, if the police came, who would have been in trouble then? But nine times out of ten, the kids... But see, I wasn't blind to the fact. I knew what it was. But that $20 was lucrative. <laughs> I understand it. So once again, they feel like this person is not looking at them in the sense of throwing them to cattle or trying to make them go to prison. They're looking at them like, this person's like my dad, this person's like my brother. This person's like a role model to me. I'm going to do anything that this person says to me because I haven't got anything. And when you're in, you're when, in. When you're in, you're in. And I if you're in an American gang, for example, but very much linked to the UK because drugs are being sourced or transited through, so it's all part of the UK criminality picture, what keeps you in there? Is it fear? Is it greed? Is it the buzz? So what I saw was low-level drug offenders come into the jail in Arizona. If they're white, immediately, skinheads from the neo-Nazi Aryan Brotherhood come yeah. up to them. Yeah, this is prison. So this is prison. That's what I'll be telling y'all. That's what I'll be telling y'all about how it's race-based in prison in America. In prison, not jail. Not county jail, not... I'm talking prison. Ask them what... Especially Arizona. The charges are, give them a heart check, you know, see if they've got any confidence about them. They figure out where they're going to fit in. Yeah. Then they put them to work. Work means committing acts of violence to earn your tattoos. And to be a full member of the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang, you have to murder someone for them in the jail. Now, under the charter of these gangs, it's blood in, blood out. Mm -hmm. They sign up to that. They're impressionable, like Chris said. They come in, maybe they haven't got family members who are supporting them. And then all of a sudden, they've got these surrogates substituting that need. Mm -hmm. But they use the hell out of them. They get them doing low-level activity, like Chris said in the beginning. Then they get into it. It's crazy, man. Some people go into jail, like, not even hardened criminals, but come out full-blown gang members on smoke. Or more serious activity to the point where they're committing murders. We had a video we got from the jail, an Aryan Brother gang member. He was murdering another inmate who'd refused to beat someone up for the gang. And the method he used to kill him, he just smashes this guy's head over and over into the concrete. Gruesome. And he's looking at the security camera and the guards aren't responding. Ten minutes in, you can see him stomping on the back of this guy's head and neck and blood going everywhere. Twenty minutes in and the guards still haven't responded. Picks the body up, brings it out like he's trying to show it off. Are you a parent who's still... Hey, Arizona built different. I believe him. I believe every word that Sean is saying right now. To the camera, throws it off the balcony, it's stuck in the rail, and he starts kicking it over and over again. Only then did they notice and put this guy down. This is how much control the gangs have got over the young people in the jail. Mm. Now that's over the jail, period. Example from an American jail. But and you know what's funny? The guards probably realized they just didn't want to intervene until it was finished. It was already started, it was done. They were just like, man, I ain't finna hold on now. What about examples of influence that street gangs in London or elsewhere in the UK might have over other children, other impressionable children? When you've got young children that exactly as you were saying, you know, we're talking about here, come from um, backgrounds where there's poverty, where the demographic of the community is poor, where you've got single parents uh, who want to do their best, who are working ridiculous hours, haven't got the time to look after their children. What happens is that those kids then turn to other people who offer them a family unity, and that's where they become part. See, that's why it's important, man, to have a full household, mother and dad, because everybody plays a role in that house, man. Dad, you protect and you provide. Mom, you look out for the kids. And not saying you can't work, but it, it, it's sometimes, it, especially when you're in a poverty situation, 
it works better if you keep an eye on your kid. That's why it's good to have multiple kids, too. So they can look out for each other. But, you know, you got to have that dad to protect. And when I say protect, it's not just physically. You got to protect mentally against people trying to invade their brains and turn them this way and turn them that way. You know what I'm saying? Both parents can do that. But a dad, is, it did hit different when your dad doing it. Part and parcel of a gang culture. Because they always say to you, you're like my brother. I'm like your mum. I'm like your dad. Mm -hmm. And what we will do is we'll look after you. We'll protect you. You just need to do A, B, C. You just need to carry this bag. Don't look in the bag, mm. OK? You take it from here to Ipswich. Take it to Ipswich and you deliver it somewhere. And that kid just goes along and does it because you know why? They earn 150 quid at the end of the day. 150 quid that puts money on the table to buy food for that family. It's a really horrible, vicious circle. And people will blame kids for being involved in that. But these are kids mm -hmm. that are already suffering trauma from a family where there's been abuse, mm -hmm. where there's been violence, where there's been sexual abuse. So when they come into these gangs, they think they've been protected by other gang members, but they're not. These gang elders are vicious, vile individuals. They will order, they will instruct, they will never get their hands dirty, they'll never have blood on their own hands. Now, you set up one of the first gang units that the Metropolitan Police had established. Was it any good? Did it, did, did it have any successes? Has it had any impact today? Yeah, I mean, what, what we did was we said... Don't lie. Just because it's your project, don't lie. It might have been in that moment having some success, but long term, tell the truth. There was already the integrated gangs unit at Hackney Borough when I joined Hackney as the proactive uh, lead for gangs. And we were being seriously criticised by the local authority, by the community, because of the fact that we had an integrated gangs unit working with local authorities, with education, probation, with charitable organisations. We actually weren't producing results. Hackney was known then as the murder mile. Yeah. So we had to do, work differently. And what we did was we worked much stronger in partnership. We had to get funding because we didn't have the funding for it. I put a business case forward. Yeah, we actually buzzing. worked with some people like the Stop and Search Scrutiny Group who are regularly criticised. We had the Gangs Matrix then, which is also subject to controversy at the moment. But through that, we identified four key members of uh, Hackney Area's gangs and we targeted those individuals. Any of y'all watch like Avengers? Like any gang criminal organization, it's like the, uh, it's like Hydra. It don't matter what you do, how many heads you cut off. I'm talking big gangs. No matter how many top dogs you take out, there's going to be more. More are going to pop up. And the crazy part of this, you like when you take out the top dog of a structure, you create a power vacuum seal. So everybody's going for the top spot trying to prove themselves. So it's going to be crazy right then and there. It's going to be crazy. Some of them top dogs is holding the piece together. Like in my mindset, it's like, yo, this can't be changed. It is what it is. Like, don't, don't, you ain't got to join them, but like realize what's going on. You take that top dog off the streets, how many people are fighting for that power? Six, seven, eight people are trying to get that spot, a top spot. It's going to get real brutal on the streets until somebody wins. And Like, mm. I'm not condoning anything, but I'm just saying, like... Individuals, and we initiated a six-month operation. But we didn't just target those individuals because what we wanted to do was get young kids out of gangs. So we held jobs fairs. We did training for <coughs> officers on the front that's line. Good. We did better training for them around stop and search because actually that's where your information and your intelligence comes from. And the job that you do is only as good as the information and the intel that you get from your local communities. Chris, you were rewarded with an OBE for your work Chris, like... getting kids away from gangs and preventing them getting into gangs. Give me some more solutions. What works? Well, this is what it's coming back down to. Like I said, I know it seems a little bit of blase and we hear it all the time, but you have to remember that these young people 
have gone through a certain like experience with a certain sense of trauma and if you're not dealing with it in the right way so this is the reasons why our company is so important and many many other charities and companies out there are so important working with young people so it's not just the programs that we deliver but like you said getting them back into education making sure they're understanding the sense of their mental health their well-being you know the ones there making sure that they're able to live within us and at the end of the day it do start with the kids man if you could change a whole generation of kids minds into steering them into a different direction than what they are used to seeing, then 10 years down the line, you are going to see that change. It's not going to be as much because obviously the OGs and the older people are either in jail, they're getting old, or they, they've, they've moved along to the afterlife. You know what I'm saying? So all of the training cops and doing this and that, yeah, you taking them off the street, salute. Salute. That is just, just like do your thing, but at the same time, it's like you throwing a rock. <laughs> you throwing a rock in the ocean. You know what I'm saying? But I'm not saying don't do what you're doing, but like focus more on the kids is my whole thing. Society. So nine times out of ten, we're questioning these young people about why are you carrying a knife, why are you doing this. Just go to college. Some of them don't even know the mental process on even how to get there. Some of them don't even know certain things to have to keep themselves safe in the sense of what they're going through. Black Lives Matter released their... True. I like Chris. I like Chris. It seemed like he got a real grip on what he got going on. Now, this lady, Met Police lady, she's... I don't know. <laughs> I like Sean, of course. And maybe it's because she ex-police. I just rubs me the wrong way, but... I just be feeling like they be saying stuff just to make themselves sound good at some certain times. But she could be on to something, you know what I'm saying? It sound good, some of it. So gang membership can, by and large, end up in imprisonment, death... Facts. ...or both. Mm -hmm. Facts. And everybody's contributions have, have, have shown that. But why do people remain loyal to a gang and that culture? Impressionable kids have got something that I call gangsteritis. Mm -hmm. They've watched too much Scarface, they've watched too much Sopranos, they've watched too much Top Boy, and they think these people are the idols. That's what they aspire to be. Now, when they get in the mix, these real gangsters mm -hmm. swallow these kids' souls, but they're so impressionable, they'll do absolutely anything for them in the beginning. And it's only when the SWAT team comes and the gang members who are the so-called family are now trying to sleep with their girlfriends mm -hmm. and don't want anything to do with them, that the wake up... Why he just described 6 9 Did he not just describe what Shadi did to 6 9 what they did to 6 9 Call happens, but it's too late by then, Peter, because then they've got 10, 20, 30-year sentences. <sighs> the mums are, are the only ones coming to visit them at the jail. Fact. That's a fact. That's a fact. Your homies is not coming to see you. Not putting real money on your books. And unless you got like a year bid or under a year bid, they're not really... After that first year, you forgot about. Just like in a rap game. If, you, if you're a rapper and you step away from the rap game for too long, you are forgot about. The same concept here. My mom came 5,000 miles and to see her in that visitation room with a broken face. It makes me sick to my stomach to this day. I work in drugs education in schools and these kids have got to think, this is a long road that you are on. Mm. The glitz, the glamour, the fun, the excitement is here, yeah. But as you get down that road, it's heartbreak for your mom. And as you said, it's the prison, please, death. Seeing your mom was... Uh, yeah, seeing your mom is heartbreaking, but see, <laughs> seeing the, the, them four walls, for 23 hours a day, it's even more heartbreaking to you. Hey, stay out of jail. I'm telling y'all, don't go there. Uh, even the UK and wherever you're at watching this, whatever country you're at, and stay out of there. Germany, y'all might, could, you know what I'm saying, y'all having a good time in jail. Like, y'all chilling, y'all at the pool, y'all getting spray tans, y'all cool. But, like, UK... Australia, Amer especially America, stay out of jail. Is that the turning point, or was there another, or were there many? <sighs> See, my mom, um, she's been outside for hours trying to get in, sniff a dog, strip, you know, search his pat downs. 
and she's come all this way. All my money was taken. They had to remortgage the house to get me a lawyer. I was facing 200 years, or I'd still be in there now. And I just feel blessed, Peter, to have such good parents. It's, um, it's something that lives with you for the rest of your life. And, yeah. America and of course, too tragically, high. many parents don't get the opportunity to go and visit their children. They go to a graveside. 100%. Um, if you had a message for any young person watching this show, what would that message be if they were being tempted? If they were into the drill, they were into the wearing the clothes, and they were thinking, I'll have Did bro just say into wearing the clothes? You lost me right there. Have some of that gang life. It's basically based on what Sean just said in the sense of think about that long term. You know, like when you're with your gang and you're with your crew. I know what he's alluding to, but like you're also alluding to other things too, but like clothes. So what do you think? People in the flats and the council houses should be wearing suits and ties. You know how much a suit and a tie is? You know how much a pair of slacks are? Like, come it's all fine, it's all glitz and glamour. But when that door closes <coughs> and you know, you ain't got your... And take price out of it, because I know some of these tracksuits are expensive, but like, no. You know what I'm saying? People in these flats coming up in these council houses have never ever seen anybody in a suit except for when they went to court. Like, what? Friends, you know? The gang glitz and glamour. That just when the door closes, and you know, you ain't got your friends, you know? The gang members don't even come up and visit you. They don't even come and check in on you to see if you're okay. Your mum's there. What about the birthdays you miss now? What about the trips that you can't go on, the country that you can't leave? What about children if you have children? And these are the kind of things that I say to them. I know that you feel like the gang is everything, but just remember when it's all gone, remember who you got left. And sometimes you have nothing. Like you said, family doesn't even come up sometimes because they're so sick and tired of coming up and supporting you. And I always say to young people... I'd be feeling like if you're in that situation and you're in the gang, like, use them as much as they're going to use you. Try to stay out of it, but, like, if you, like... I can't, like, knock it. Like, you know what I'm saying? But So it's like, try your best to stay out of it. But at the same time, make sure it's going both ways. And just know that they not going to be there when it when it's all upside down. It's all man for himself. There is no honor amongst thieves. So all of that gang, 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 we together since potty chain. All, I love my brother. No. You get life. They, they're going to go live their life. Probably have another child with your baby mama. Like, Just keep in mind, man. Just like when you go to work. Make sure you're getting the best out of the work. Make sure you're getting the best out of your job situation. Make sure you're getting everything you can from that job. Because at the drop of a dime, they will disregard you. You are not important to them. They are You are replaceable. Think about it. If a 30 year old man is saying to you, come and do this, ask yourself, why is he standing there talking to you? Ask him the question, why are you here? I'm 16. I know why I'm messing about on the street. What are you doing? Where's your job? Why haven't you got your life to give on? Start asking them questions. Ask yourself, why is he, why does he want to he hang You might want to ask yourself that in your mind. Don't straight out ask bro that because he might be like, he might be having some inner demons going through some stuff and you might trigger something if you ask him that. Stay safe. Hanging around with me, I'm 16, he's 35. Surely there's nothing, something wrong with his mentality. So that's what I want Kunz kids to start understanding and ask the question. Fabulous. Shabnam, what are the police going to do? What should they be doing? Have they got the resources to do it? What are they going to do to try and tackle this intractable problem? Policing has been given a huge amount of funding, particularly across London, by the mayor in terms of tackling gang violence. But I think the two key issues are sat here, right in this room. You've got Sean there and you've got Chris here. The bottom line is, unless you get people that have lived and breathed it, you are not going to be able to communicate with young people. That's a fact. OK, OK, she's spitting facts now. All right. I, I don't know what it is. Just the ex-police thing just rubbed me the wrong way, but she just spit the realest fact that I heard anybody spit. 
not anybody here, but anybody in an ex-police or police role. Because whilst I had 31 years in policing and you've got some fantastic detectives and police officers out there... You'll never know. ...who want to what make it like. better for young people. We are there to bring offenders to justice. There will always be that barrier between the police and the uh, general, those involved in gangs. If you get people that have lived and breathed it, that I would have talked to them, I would have talked them out of it, to tell them there's no glamour in gangs. It's a dirty, murky, ugly world where you will be very, very lonely. There's no such thing as family within gangs. GoDaddy is a part... So I just said that. She ain't lying. Excuse me. Well, thank you all. No problem. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure. A brilliant conversation, and I'm indebted to you. I'm glad I could, you know, come on this show and be a part of it. Um, and give a little insight. You all. Cheers. Now, moving on to this week's postcode. No. To your little, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notice. I'm gone.